trying to belittle. Take the F off your fubu, make you sit like Ubu. Boss is sweeping up, nobody can do what you do. If pro black going out of style, let's save it. Cause war is money and Bill Atkins at Camp David. Bombs in the fetal position on the pavement. Music got to lift, you want X, then go for Raven. Scary neighbors wave, the cops at night get swilling. Come up from church and foreign stores, think you're stealing. Shops and not spots where our money make a killing. For every project, it's a building they condemning. Trash playgrounds like pants and knee hemming. When we fight, it's war, then we really get winning. Winning, winning. <laughs> oh my goodness, I'm so happy to be here. I'm so happy. Um, wow. Wow. So I'm so so one of the things, good morning, by the way. But one of the things that was really important for us is that we knew this would be a webinar. And I'm just talking, I haven't introduced myself, but I'm so excited to be here. But I am a Kiba Foster. But let me just say what I was gonna say. So we wanted to create some kind of community. And so we're so happy that the music is resonating with you all because, you know, sometimes you can check into a webinar and you feel a little isolated. And so music is a way that we bring people together. And this is going to be a wonderful two-day event. So good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are at in the world, we thank you for joining us today. So I am Akiba Foster. I am the manager of the African American Research Library and Cultural Center located in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, which is a flagship library of the Broward County Library System. I serve as the project director for Archiving the Black Web grant, and along with our partner organizations, which include the African American Museum and Library of Oakland, represented by Bamadele Demerson, the Auburn Avenue Research Library on African American Culture and History, represented by Mr. Derek Mosley, the Langston Hughes Community Library and Cultural Center with Shakira Smalls, and the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture with Zakia Collier, um, also Spelman College Archives with Ms. Holly Smith, who's been holding it down in the chat and rapping along with the music, and also with our friend, my partner, my ace, um, Burgess Jules with Shift Collective, as well as John Voss behind the scenes being our mega producer so for this day. So from all of us, we are so very excited to have you here and we would like to welcome you to this historic convening of the archiving of the Black Web National. But from what I see from um, the chat where we have folks checking in from London, as well as some of our international panelists, we are internationally known as well. So thank you for all for joining us today. And so what also is important for us to share is that we would especially like to thank our funders, the Institute of Library and Museum Services for supporting this very important exploratory work, which we know sometimes is not often afforded to black collecting institutions. So through our own agency and inspired by the wisdom of the ancestors who made a way out of no way a lot of times, this project intends to create opportunities to support black collecting institutions as we collaboratively construct a plan for archival collections building for arch archival collection building related to digital content and web practices of black people online. So we hope that after these two days that you are persuaded to to join us um, in this particular project of, of building uh, capacity for black collecting institutions who whose whose missions have always held up the idea that black lives matter. Yet within this digital age, they are falling behind in terms of access to tools and resources that equip them to document the digital lives of black people. And so finally, before I turn it over to my uh, project advisor, Burgess Jules, um, let me be clear about this project and what will happen over the next few days. You will be inspired. You will be possibly enraged. You will find some measure of joy and most importantly, you will find that this forum, and I'm very proud to say, is unapologetic in centering Blackness. Black people, Black joy, all of that is Black. And so, in other words, it's Blackity, Black, Black, Black. And so if that is a problem for you, guess what? 
you can log off. But this is going to be edifying in a lot of ways. And we are just so happy to have you here. And we're happy to, to bring all of the wonderful panelists and the discussions that will happen over the next two days. And now I'm going to turn it over to my ace. Burgess, take it away. Hey, Makiba, can you hear me? Okay, everyone. Awesome. Thanks so much for that really powerful um, welcome, um, Makiba. It's so great to have been uh, working with you on this for the last, it seems like forever now, year and a half, we've been trying to put this together. Um, so it's really nice to see it happening now. Um, so I also want to, you know, my name is Burgess Jules. I work with the Shift Collective, um, and I'm really excited to be here. Really excited to see all of you all. Um, at last check, we had 840 um, folks uh, registered. So hopefully folks will be showing up throughout the day. I um, have to give a huge thanks to our panelists. Um, you know, we know that in these days, uh, you know, it's, everybody is at capacity and um, folks were just so generous with their time. So I really want to just, just, you know, thank folks again for being with us. We have 30 um, panelists who will be speaking with you over the next two days. And everyone we asked uh, said yes, uh, which was really amazing. Um, so we really appreciate that. Um, this was also supposed to be an in-person uh, event and uh, obviously, for all the reasons uh, it is not happening in person. And so, you know, we've put a lot of time into um, doing this virtually and we have a lot of support. Um, really appreciate my colleague, John Voss, helping out uh, in the background here today, um, another, my uh, Shift Collective um, colleague. But, you know, bear with us today as we switch, you know, back and forth through panels and, you know, you know, we'll be, uh, we'll, we'll need some grace today for sure. Um, but hopefully everything uh, over the next two days, but hopefully everything will, will go great. Um, also, uh, thanks to you and just a couple quick um, logistics, um, Makiba, I'm just going to mention them here because people might miss them in the chat. Um, so if you have questions for the panelists, uh, please put those in the Q&A. Um, you should see the um, uh, Q&A option um, at the bottom of your, of your Zoom screen here. So if you have questions for the panelists, please put those in there so we can see them. Uh, the chat, as you can tell, gets pretty loud. So um, we, won't, we probably won't see too many questions in there. So if you have questions for the panelists, um, put them in the Q&A. Um, I saw this question in the chat. Um, yes, all the sessions will be recorded. So um, we will put those, it might take us a week or so, but we'll put the, um, the panel um, recordings on our YouTube uh, page and we'll be sharing that, um, linking that on our website and also sharing that on our social media, uh, which I believe um, Holly and some other folks are sharing links to in the chat um, as we speak. So really excited uh, for this. Uh, I'm excited for the whole conference, um, uh, the whole forum, but I'm really excited for this, um, this, this first panel um, today. Um, and, you know, I've always wanted to bring um, uh, these scholars and archivists and memory workers and, and independent memory workers in the same space to talk about this issue. And we were able to do that, um, I think. Um, so this first panel today, um, is, is really exciting and I think you'll learn a lot. Um, I, I think what we wanted to do with the first panel today is really just sort of lay the groundwork, um, you know, as black collecting organizations, as, as archivists and information professionals who are starting um, to really think about how we do some long-term sort of documentation of um, uh, the black experience online. Um, you know, we think it's really important that we understand the history of Black folks um, uh, being involved in the development of the web, being involved in sort of um, the web economy, just being involved in the internet in general. Um, and this first panel is really um, that opportunity to, to, to do that, to share that knowledge uh, with you all. So I'm really excited for the folks that we have um, for the first panel here. And I believe, um, so what we'll do here is we'll just do a brief introduction and you could go to our website, which Holly will, um, Holly Smith will share in the chat uh, if you want to read um, folks' bios 
um, and learn a little bit more about them. Uh, check out their, give them a follow on social media, check out their websites. Um, but we'll just, you know, in order to just, you know, stay on time here, we'll just read the bios. Um, we'll just tell you who the folks are and then we'll turn it over uh, to them. All right, so what are we doing here? So first up um, for this session today, uh, not new to this, we true to this, the black presence online from then to now, uh, we have Dr. Andre Brock, who's an associate professor of media studies uh, at Georgia Tech. Um, Dr. Catherine Knight Steele, who's an assistant professor um, of communication at the University of Maryland College Park. Um, Dr. Charlton McElwain, uh, Vice Provost for Faculty Engagement and Development and Professor in Media, Culture and Communication at NYU, and Dr. Raven Mara Lloyd. I really hope I said your name correctly there, Raven. Um, please correct me if, if, um, if I didn't. Uh, Raven is an Assistant Professor of Communication Studies at Gonzaga. So like I said, uh, these, uh, this first panel is going to be just giving us sort of the lay of the land. Um, you know, they've all written amazing books and articles and, and pieces about, about sort of the history of Black folks online. And we're really excited to, um, to have them share their knowledge with you today. So just give me one second to bring folks on screen and then we will get started. Here we go. So I think you're all on screen now and I'll let you all take it over. Thanks again. Hey, everybody. Hey, hey, hey. Hello. <laughs> I'm excited to be able to talk to you all. Not that we don't talk, but you know to talk like this too. I, I have right. to say on, I'm, I'm excited to be in this space for sure and and be with people I've been reading since grad school so right. all the grad students in the audience I'm repping for y'all like I I feel like I got a seat at the table it's crazy so I'm honored to be here with y'all oh Raven we stand here you. so you know <laughs> we get to be with Raven <laughs> No, it is amazing. And I think Dre and I were talking about this in a different context last week. Um, the way that so many of us who are doing this work now, when we started in grad school, this work didn't exist. Right. And we were making it up as we went and trying to find community with other people right. who were doing it because it was so important to us to create this space. And it's really exciting yeah. to now have Black digital studies and Black archival studies and, you know, to be um, what I see my see students actually applying and saying their interest area is, you know, right. and saying that this is their focus of research and, and naming that before even coming into graduate school. Mm -hmm. So it's an exciting time, I think, to, to be on this side of it and to watch that made manifest for sure. Agreed. Absolutely. I'm going to I'm going to take the opportunity to ask a, a selfish question because I've never had the opportunity to ask either of you this. And uh, I'm very fascinated by where did where did we all begin? Like when when were we first mm. online and what did that look like at the time for you? And when did that sort of change and shift from being or if there was a shift from being just mm. something we do to something we study um, in some way? I love this question because I think it, um, it's some, I, there was a point at which I hadn't thought about it and then I had to write a book and I had to think about it a lot. And I was thinking about how, um, how our relationship, specifically I was writing about black women, where our relationship begins with technology in our minds and what, how that shapes so much of what we are. So I, I wrote this thing about how Mavis Beacon taught me to type and how impactful it was 
Am I dating myself a little bit with Mavis Beacon? Y'all know who Mavis Beacon is. She taught <laughs> us to type. Come on. Yes. And and so when Mavis Beacon was teaching me to type after school on the shared family computer, that, that was really the beginning of a relationship with not just computing, right? But with the idea that what I shared and what I did online was for me and wasn't for someone else. Because Black folks have always had a long relationship with technology, right? But what the idea of personal computing and then the internet and the web did was say that I can write and share my thoughts in a space that is about me and for me and is not because someone else is paying me to be their typist or paying me to, you know, share or create or edit or do something with their ideas. Mm -hmm. So um, I got online you know, in those AOL chat rooms before I should have in that Black Planet space before I should have probably. But I think my relationship, my real deep love affair with the web was black, the Black blogosphere. And that happened because I was in places where I was surrounded by whiteness and surrounded by whiteness in ways that felt like I was very isolating and isolated um, coming out of college. And, and the Black blogosphere was home in my cubicle, it was home space where I could actually be around the folks who talked and looked like me. So that was my my origin of, of both being in online social media spaces, but then also what I chose to write about when I got the opportunity to do that. It's crazy how this just comes off the top of her head, I think. I, <laughs> I think know. <laughs> this is just what, but Catherine, I love what you mentioned about um, the web being a space for you. It's not, I write about resistance. So a lot of the work I do has to do with black digital publics and what they do to technology or what they do for the spaces around them. But I'm starting to think about care and care networks um, in relationship. I'm thinking as you're saying about my own journey. So coming from Jamaica to the US to Oklahoma of all places. Um, as a teenager and Facebook was a way for me to connect my diasporic blackness, like a way to connect literally back home. And then we created care networks. Like we had private spaces. You've written about enclaves, Catherine and others, right? So we had our own private spaces and then going to college um, that was in the early 2000s where black Twitter didn't even have a name yet, but that's what we were doing. Like we were in classes, the only black person in class and tweeting about, can you believe the professor just said this? Can you believe somebody just turned to me and said, oh, I've never met a black person before. Let me touch her, you know? Um, and Twitter was the space for us to, to commune. We didn't use words community. We didn't use words care, but that's what we're doing. I'm thinking, yeah, in my work a lot about what we do for each other and ourselves, not just for outsiders, right? Mm -hmm. Really, I have to go now? <laughs> uh, there, there's a definite uh, split between Andre, who had a digital persona as early as 97, which isn't really all that early. Uh, I'm speaking specifically early. internet work, internet work, uh, because I, you know, Charles and I have talked about this. Uh, we've had uh, Commodore 64s. We spent time on trash 80s, right? Uh, we, we definitely had connections uh, to computer networks and computers before that. But the me that you guys may not have seen on my Twitter account, because I don't have one, um, <laughs> <laughs> is do not um, follow do not follow uh first came to life in all places where i was uh the blackest new york city uh, and i started following uh black voices uh which was barry i can't remember barry's last name uh, Richard with the tribune company right barry cooper and then black planet uh but then i made this transition to grad school in 2001 uh actually uh my third day of class was 9 11 right um and I began to realize that the me that I saw uh, in those online spaces, the connections I'd built, the interpersonal relationships, and we'll leave that as the euphemism mm -hmm. that I built in those spaces were not uh, visible in the research that I was uh, being shown about digital divide right. or even like the protest research, shout out to uh, Anna, um, yeah, yeah. And I ever it right with the black woman Absolutely. march, yeah. right? Uh, it wasn't being shown in those spaces either. And I was like, well, where's right. the mundane? I didn't think about it like that, but that's inevitably how I ended up here, right? right. And so um, where 
uh, folk like to disparage what brown folk do with research. They're like, oh, well, that's just me search. It's right. not uh, objective enough. But imagine when you're confronted with an entire field of technological, technocultural achievement, and you're not visible at all. Like that's not right. me search. And I'll be damned if right. I'm not going to be visible in those spaces right. as well. And so it was the introduction to digital divide research with this deficit oh. models. It was the introduction to critical race theory uh, writ large, like, I, you know, Toni Morrison's playing in the dark hit me in the head really hard, mm. right? It came out right around that same time. And so to be confronted with these two spaces, I was like, there has to be a rhetoric of technology. There has to be. And there was, it just wasn't about computers yet, which leads us uh -huh. to where, you know, Charlton is kind of re, re interweaving these strands where rhetoric of technology should by nature include the efforts of black pioneers in these spaces. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. And my, my story comes as a, as a mixture of, of all these in some ways. And so, I, you know, I, my first interaction, this is grad school, of course, this is, you know, again, dating 96, 97. Um, I didn't have much patience for AOL. I could get on, I could see the chats, I could see, um, you know, net noirs. But for me at that time, everything was out in, you know, the streets as it was. Um, and not so much online, but I remember my first thing significantly that's archived, I think on the web that happened somewhere around 97 or 98. And that was me um, signing a petition about reparations for the Tulsa uprisings. Um, so Raven, I was in uh, Oklahoma and lived in Oklahoma for 14 years. Um, so that was my significant first. Um, and then, you know, I had, the, the online space for me wasn't something a focus either in the mundane and sort right. of everyday life or uh, for scholarship until the work that I started to do in the first part of my career around um, Black politics, Black electoral politics, and so forth. Um, I started to notice that the people I was hanging out with, the people I was working with, scholars, activists, and others, they were shifting to the places that they were doing their work to online spaces. And so that's where I began with, um, you know, the, the blogosphere, um, the black blogosphere in particular, uh, a colleague and I had started an early blog called This Week in Race as a way to start talking and uh, uh, thinking about some of these right. things. But that's that moment when we started to recognize other folks who were speaking and to, um, a, a, a community that was starting to be there, but often, uh, you know, speaking into the void. And yeah. then, and in my wrap up, <clears throat> I think, you know, and then where this hit me hard and sort of the return for me was in writing um, Black Software. And I remember a critical moment, <clears throat> and you all mentioned it and talking about the digital divide. I remember looking up some of the, the data at the time around 96, 97, when the um, uh, 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 Commerce Department did some of their first research and studies about the digital divide. And I kept focusing on this number that I had to go through the data and calculate to actually come up with the number, but something like 5.8 million people, Black people, who in 1995, 96 had a computer, had a computer at home, uh, had a modem, were online. My thought was, who the hell are this 5.8 million Black folks? I don't know anything about them because all I've heard is the divide, Black people don't have access, Black people haven't done anything. And so that was my way into yeah. trying to discover that roots where we all uh, started and came from. I think the persistence of the divide narrative is just so fascinating, right? Like, because you're, you're encountering it in the late 90s and the early 2000s. I'm encountering it in grad school in 08. You know, like, there's this persistent narrative that was happening that Black folks weren't online and the Black folks who were online were incapable of doing the things they were supposed to with this technology. And all of us, I think, were, you know, reading this consuming this, but going home and living these lives online that didn't match what the scholarship said. And so I think for, for many of us, it came from this place of just, we are here, right? Like, and that what's happening here must be documented. There has to be some pushback to this. And so I think as Dre said, also for me, then the narrative shifted to the politics of Black folks online, right? So Black folks are online, but they're online to do like 
organizing and activism. And I was like, I'm online to read trash. Like I'm, I'm online to talk right. stuff with people. I'm online to find out about my hair. Like I'm online to talk about Beyonce. So what, where is the space for that? Mm -hmm. And I know this comes through a lot in the work that Dre does, and it's been really, you know, inspirational for so many of us to say that, that those spaces are as important, are as critical, if not more so sometimes to the discussion of the wholeness of Blackness mm -hmm. and the wholeness of Black people in those spaces. And so we have to make room to talk about things that are not um, the quote race-centered things, because that framework for studying blackness is insufficient right. and we've been given that by other folks that the only way we can study black people is by studying the deficiency the problem narrative you know that there's a deficit um, and so if we center blackness as whole in and of itself right. already it opens up so many more avenues for us to really consider what's going on there and so many more possibilities for us to understand how and i will say this forever that black folks show us the possibilities and constraints of technology you know, if only we are attuned to that. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think this is where Black feminist thought comes into play so well, because it's not just about interlocking oppressions. It's not just about the struggle, right? It's about life and living and joy and right. sometimes responding to the struggle. Um, this cup you have is amazing, <laughs> this chalice. <laughs> <laughs> um but but it, right like black feminist thought focuses on both we're we're not right. it's not just about the struggle and that's incomplete like you're saying mm -hmm. to charlton's point about the black divide i'm also seeing in recent years um a narrative of like hyper access online which i think comes mm -hmm. from individualism right like this idea of well we all have access online so i think mm -hmm. we're moving from the space of mm -hmm. black people are deficient online to okay, y'all got Black Lives Matter, we good now, right? Or y'all got a hashtag, so we're equal now, right? Um, and so that's what I'm also thinking through and responding to in my work is like, no, <laughs> like a hashtag isn't it, right? There's, there's so much more work to be done, not necessarily by us, but I'm saying um, having access to the web isn't, isn't the end of, of these conversations either. Yeah, I think it's <clears throat> I think it's important to remember, you know, when we're talking about centering black people and black people on the on the web uh, in particular, that those early moments, those early moments that really stretch back to the late 80s and even pre web forms and so forth that showed so much of that possibility for uh, black folks and which black folks embraced and wholeheartedly saw this as a new space um, to be able to connect, to build community, to uh, uh, push community uplift in a variety of ways, social, economic, political, et cetera, and gave us a glimpse of what could be. And I, I always think it's fascinating. I used to have a, a title, I'm sorry I dropped it from the, the, the book, a title of a chapter once that was called Remember When the Internet Was Black. Mm. And it had everything to do with what if we had historically come to learn about the internet from its starting point, which is centrally black, at least in my imagination, right? Um, and that it showed, you know, when 94, 95 came around and your AOLs and your CompuServes and so forth came around and wanted to know how do we get users on this new thing, which nobody knew about at that time, they went to black folks to find that model for community building for connecting. Um, and that was their model for uh, proceeding. And then we get into the, the mid part of the 90s and the, the digital divide stuff. But also, as you mentioned, Raven, this idea that, you know, this is free and open access to everyone. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not reality. Access right. might be a bit, it's the barrier or it's the entry point, but it's not the end all be all. And the fact is that we showed the world the way about what this medium could look like and could do, uh, and then got cut off from actually realizing the dreams that we had first uh, imagined. Yeah, there's so much of that, um, you know, in the midst of the deficiency of Black folks narrative, right? The simultaneous thing that happened, I'd say like, you know, early 2000s <clears throat> with the idea of like the virtual community and the 
over optimism of the democratic possibilities of the web to counter all of the political and historical issues of not only access, but of just white supremacy, right? And so um, we're writing at a time where we're simultaneously trying to make space to say we're here and this thing actually does provide us possibilities, but also uh, counter this idea that the possibilities of the web therefore undo all the structural you right. know, issues right. of the pol right. of politics and of, of racism that exists in the country. And so what I appreciate, I think, about all of your work is the nuance of that, that I think is lost and had been lost for a long time in a lot of other spaces. And so what I, I believe the Black Digital Studies does is provide us that nuanced take because Black folks have always had to have it, right? The, co the combination of the optimism and the realism, the combination of the pushing yes. forward and the looking back, right? And that's what Black studies brings to a, a, any discipline when added, right? Is that you're going to have to think about the possibilities of this technology, all of the spaces of community, all the spaces of activism, of joy, of all these things. But you can't do that and neglect thinking about the way that technologies uh, reify and set up more spaces for hate speech and harassment and all the things that are happening to us as humans offline as well. So, I mean, I, this is the, the beautiful thing about Black feminist thought and about Black critical studies that is, has come to internet studies and I hope is being embraced by more people as they begin to not just study Black folks are online, but what does it mean to do Black critical thinking online to add Black thought to these spaces? Mm -hmm. Dre, you better talk. I was I was gonna say I want to hear about being ratchet online, a chapter in your book. We're not there yet. Um, do, do you right now? <laughs> do, do you ratchet at all? I'm I'm gonna need y'all to stop living vicariously through me and get ratchet online your damn stuff. First uh, of all, that's what burner accounts are for. <laughs> I was gonna say the way this tenure situation set up. Right. Uh, right. These tenure people really talk to us about how ratchet Hello. we need to be in public spaces. Hello. I just I just Let got us tenure live. this year, fam. Let so us live. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, 2020 <laughs> is my, my second tenure. <laughs> um, but I would like to revisit, and this is a response to something Charlton said, uh, is that uh, one of the canonical texts I use whenever I teach about race, gender, and the internet is this poem by Amiri Baraka uh, from Rage, Rage, yes. and Race called Technology and Ethos. Yes. And it was really inspirational. I even recreated some of it in my chapter on distributed blackness because Baraka talks about what if we had an expression scriber? Right? What if we had something that allowed Black people to use every part of their body in order to communicate, no longer limited to fingers and eyeballs, which are distancing yeah. from the, the world. Instead, we could put our rhythms into the types of, of speech we had. So I, in my hubris, I said, you know, to me, that's the answer to what is the Black purposes of space travel, which is a question that mm. Baraka asked, because to me, Twitter is that answer. Mm -hmm. Right. We transfer, mm -hmm. we, we transmit ourselves across time and space and That's constitute funny. ourselves on the screens and in the ears of the people who we're corresponding with. And our blackness is very never, never in question. Right. Particularly if you, you talk to the right people. Right. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I think that there are that theoretical antecedents for the work that we do. Um, mm -hmm. I'm also deeply enamored with uh, intersectionality. Uh, and also Afro-pessimism, which we will not talk about today because that's a whole nother panel. Uh, but theoretically, <laughs> I think it. we were already prepared. Uh, there's, a, there's a second, there's another article that I also use written by Kali Tao and uh, Wired in 1996. And she says, why aren't technologists looking at the study of alienation in other spaces like Du Bois wrote about in 1903? Oh. Right. <laughs> and so, yeah. you know, I have built on that work and others have done much better that, with it than I have. But to talk about the fact that we we who have always already been considered separate from our bodies, that our bodies are mere right. vessels of clay and not worthy of uh, thought yeah. or agency or whatever, we've That's already right. learned how to exist under that regime. And the Internet yeah. merely is just another space where we can do that dance, oh. uh, do the Heisman on that. Uh, and, <laughs> and 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 be the inventive people using the tools of of language and wit, right, to reconstitute ourselves in these spaces. And so, to me, that uh, while we may not have been seen in the literature, and Charlton and I were part of a um, Smithsonian um, 
lecture last fall that talked about the difficulty of finding black technologists in the archives, which is mm -hmm. kind of sort of why we're here, right? Uh, because in many cases they weren't deemed as worthy or a white person had to co-sign their uh, mm -hmm. inventions and in the process took the credit for it, right? That's right. Uh, but even, if, even with those minute traces, one of the things I talk about in my work and have talked about for years is condensing nuance out of vapor. Mm. Right, So we already smell what the rock is cooking, however you want to put it, and we are able, as the, the gifted scholars you see on your screen, are able to pull together those traces to show that Blackness has been here, will be here, and, you know, will continue to be productive, regardless of what regimes of racial capitalism or white supremacy and the like will be in these spaces. See, you asked me to talk. I've had <laughs> coffee. That's your fault. <laughs> That's your fault. I'm so glad you brought in the body, though. Like, uh, this sort of embodied experience, especially online. I'm thinking of a um, piece I just wrote for American Journal of Play, because they're writing a special issue, Blackness at Play, and arguing that Blackness is missing in, in this whole um, field of play, because they assume we all play the same, right? Which we know mm -hmm. um, isn't the case. But in the piece I'm talking about, um, Mel Watkins, Ingredients of Black Humor. And he talks about like, um using your body like black lot you know it's like five ingredients of black humor or racial humor and one of it is the body like your body has to be you see i'm already doing with the hands like your body has to be a part of it um and i don't think we focus on that enough online i'm so glad your work does well it, yeah, and i think what oh go ahead charles well, go ahead go ahead please i was just gonna say what what dre and, and raven are talking about i mean the title of this panel right about not new to this but true to this is really, I think, and why I love this grouping of people together is our insistence on focusing on the history, right? Yeah. Which, you know, I'm as, as happy as I am that more and more people are interested in studying Black folks online and now have mm -hmm. a literature to do that. Mm -hmm. I think if we don't do that through this historical lens, you're missing it. Like you're missing the point here, right? And so if you're starting at Twitter, You've right. missed several hundred years of Black mm -hmm. folks just in these United States right. doing technology, right? Like doing this and, and being a part of the creation of technological spaces and, be, and having technological expertise that you have to kind of keep this persistent threat. Mm -hmm. Stop, Dre. Stop causing trouble in the chat. I see you <laughs> in the corner and I'm telling you to stop. <laughs> Because, and, 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 I, and I understand the, the, the desire to do that, right? Like I understand being situated in 2021 and saying like, so much has happened online with black people. I have to bound my study and I have to talk about what's going on in this particular platform and in this particular way. But as you know, Sarah Florini reminds us in our book, nobody experiences technology that way. Nobody does right. technology by platform. We are floating right. between here and there and we are carrying right. these pieces around. And what's more than that, what we have in us started before the web, like started before mm. social media. And so to Dre's point about the body and technology, right? Like Black folks being the tools of technology for the infrastructure that builds the country provides us right. with this historical understanding of what tools and technology mean for white supremacy, what they mean for us as community members, what they mean for resistance, but what they also mean for our agency, what it means to detach ourselves from this definition of ourselves as tools or as tech mm -hmm. for the use and mm -hmm. utility of someone else, right? So mm -hmm. how do we simultaneously, are we the tools of an infrastructure that is dominating us, is oppressing us, but also then reclaiming the agency of our body as a technology, right. our voice as a technology that right. moves in a way away from that, right? And so you're gonna have to begin before the web. You're gonna have to begin before a smartphone to capture that. That's why I love, you know, Ray Fouché's work on voice and technology. That's why I love that, you know, Charlton is, is telling us you can't start with Twitter, right? That Dre is saying, you're gonna have to look back to look forward. And I think that's what all of us are trying to do in our work is remind people that this didn't just start. And if you start here and you're just gonna capture these tweets and you're gonna say, this happened this many times on this day, you know, bless you, you're going to find out something, but you're going to miss quite a bit with that. All of this reminds me of, I had an opportunity this, this uh, week for some other project or a panel or something, but going back through uh, old Usenet archives, mm. man, mm -hmm. such a goldmine when you think about, you know, what we were all mentioned in terms of uh, being here, Black culture, Black people, 
uh, black agency preceding the web, preceding the digital, um, so that you show up in these spaces. When, when Usenet comes aboard, it's not as if we've got to figure out, oh, how do we do this? How do exactly. we operate? I don't, we're right. just here. And I always think it's funny to think about that, um, you know, that fantasy of the early internet as being, you know, race blind, color blind, all those kinds of things. And black, uh, black folks from, from jump saying, oh no, I don't want to, we don't want to be blind. I'm here. Here I am. Mm -hmm. If you can't see me, I will make myself visible to you uh, linguistically or what have mm -hmm. you. Uh, but I want to make sure that you see me, that you see us, you see who we are and what we do. And I, I always, uh, I like that juxtaposition and love to think about those early moments, but it's in a lot of ways, I think it's a, a picture of some of our deficit in terms of the archive because that's the, that's the earliest point I can think of that's sort of documented to go back to, you know, those Usenet uh, archives, mm -hmm. but so much of that period right before that in the mid and early 80s is lost uh, in a lot of ways because it's gone with the people who were there and no way to really document or preserve uh, yeah. what was happening even, even before. Mm -hmm. Well, this is the thing I love. Um, so I, in, in grad school, worked with Steve Jones, right? And who's like, you know, godfather internet studies. But he, uh, what he gave to us was the idea that you can study a platform right now, or you can study the people and the way that people communicate, right? And when you study the way that people communicate, when new platforms come about, you already understand how to study that and how to position the people who are communicating in the ways that they've always been communicating in those spaces. So what Charlton says about like a new platform comes about and it seems like black people just know how to use it. Well, if you study the black people and if you study the way that black people communicate, then when TikTok pops up, it's not shocking that black content creators are doing X, or, Y, and Z. It's not or surprising clubhouse. or clubhouse, right? Like you can see that coming, you can understand what's to come next and how black folks will use it. And then how folks will take away their ability to use it in order to monetize. Like we know what's coming with Clubhouse. We understood when Clubhouse blew up, exactly how it would be monetized, exactly how black folks would be pushed out of this space, exactly how the work of black folks would be used to turn this into an entity that could be profitable until mm -hmm. it was profitable to black folks. And then we would have to move somewhere else because they would take away, take that away. Like you can get it, you can see the strand because it doesn't change, right? The 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 way that we communicate and the way that people are, are scared of it, right? It doesn't change over time. Mm -hmm. I want Raven to say something, but I also feel like we should redirect based on Catherine and Charlton's comments, because one of the reasons why we're here is this is part of a uh, archiving the Black web conversation, okay. right? Yeah. And so when you're identifying platforms, right, and, and spaces where people talk, how do you capture that data for further analysis mm -hmm. on our part, but also for the historical record further on? But Raven, I know you got something to say. We've been working together too long for, for yeah. this, so talk I, a little bit more about your work. I was actually, you really don't put me on the spot like that. Cool. Absolutely. Always. He always will. It's not a problem. I was actually going to say to Catherine's last point, I hope like her point cannot be overstated. Like I hope the audience got that about this idea of studying Black publics and studying Black communication practices regardless of platform. I hope, I hope y'all got that because that was, we, I see so much of that, right? And, and um and work coming up so we definitely need to prioritize black practices as kat just said um to your question about how to study the web so apparently black twitter is for old heads now this is what my students tell me i was like damn i'm not be that right i was like i'm an old head dang so black tiktok is the and again to your point Catherine, like black tiktok is the new thing and blah 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 um but the questions remain the same. And so it, what I'm thinking through in my book right now, it's about strategic rearticulations of resistance. So each chapter is a different resistance strategy of black folks. So it's racial humor is one chapter, archiving is one chapter. In the archiving chapter, I talk about um, the black delegation has voted. Uh, well, that's, mm -hmm. um, that's a power chapter. So the archiving chapter was, Oh, Juneteenth, 
Um, so the, I talk about how the world just awakened to Juneteenth in 2020, right? Like now it's on the calendar or whatever. Um, but black folks been talking about Juneteenth, especially online and using visual signifiers to remember what Juneteenth meant for, for them. And here I wanna specify like black Americans, right? I mentioned I'm from Jamaica and then migrated here, I'm a citizen now, but you know, there's a difference with, with um, black Americans experience. Um, but Juneteenth itself is a way I think that black folks have archived um, visually their own culture in ways that dominant culture is just now getting hip to. So each chapter I'm talking about different resistance strategies, like I said, racial humor, archiving. One chapter is about care as resistance. Um, and another chapter is the black delegation is voted. So I'm talking about like power. What does it mean to imagine we have the power to say, uh, DAPs are suspended because of the Rona. Like we have that power, right? Um, and what does imagination look like for us? Um, and so in my work then I'm thinking about resistance really with joy and I know Dre might disagree, but I don't- You can join our, our ongoing fight about joy and resistance anytime, I, right? Okay, now. Please, we do, it all, we do think, it all day, every day. Okay, I don't think the two are <laughs> antithetical. I think- They're not. Right. They're not. Humor is resistance. You can Karen and Permit Patty, which is the chapter, right? Like you can be funny and resistive at the same time. Even if that's not your goal, it's still highlighting white femininity and the problems of white femininity when we talk about Karens. But come at me, Dre. That's fine. Um, but yeah, I'll stop. Dre, no, Dre's question too, though, about like documenting it and archiving it and preserving it, I think is one that a lot of us have been ha having conversations about more lately as you know, our impetus, as we talked about for starting this was we're here, right? And like, you have to take note of this. Uh -huh. And I feel like in the last few years, many of us have been thinking about, wait a second, we are here, but I don't know that I need everybody to know what we're doing over here. Uh -huh. And there's been this moment of, of hopefully people thinking very clearly about what it means to preserve um, everybody's everything online and notions of publicity and privacy that we definitely should be thinking about in terms of how we document yeah. uh, folks and how we comment on folks. And so I, yeah. I talk about a lot of times how so much of what I do online with the blogosphere was me just like writing down notes at the time it was happening, co copying whole paragraphs into Word documents and like, you know, <laughs> really like, um, kind of qualitative field work is how it was happening at the time. I saw this thing and here's what it felt like and here's what was going on. And not realizing that how important that actual strategy still is for us mm. as we see things like Instagram stories and the technology becomes such that you can preserve what someone meant to only be there a short time. Mm. And should you actually be preserving things that were meant to be seen by a particular group of people at a moment and weren't actually ever intentionally supposed right. to be long-term documented in a way. And I think that we have to have really critical conversations around our role in preserving everybody's words right. forever right. and what it means if we're going to do that in spaces where people did not have that goal. So I think about it like, you know, if I'm studying, if somebody comes in to study a church, study my church, um, I we maybe weren't supposed to be there. That what happened in that moment in that day was about the people who were in that space. Uh -huh. It was a sacred space. And I actually didn't need you to record it all. And so now I think about that as a researcher and the folks that I follow and the folks, the yeah. communities that I'm a part of, that I want to be around those spaces while they're happening. One, because it's better research practice right. to right. actually see it while it's going on for me, rather than to see it 20 days later or 17 days later, whatever, because there are things happening at that moment that I need to understand contextually while I'm reading it to be a good researcher, right? I need to know what was happening in the rest of the world while this discourse online was happening. I need to have felt those things. Um, but also, should I be holding uh, a long-term archive of the discourse that I'm collecting online and what happens when that is accessible to a large group of people? And I would love to open that up for us to think about for a little bit in terms of our methods and our practice. Well, Catherine, I was gonna ask you, how do you, how do you find that balance particularly given you know, the amplification of all of this now and the digital tools yeah. that we have. And so the rush is really because we can capture everything. Let's go capture. And then, so where do Figure we draw the line between yeah. sort mm -hmm. of capture versus mm -hmm. let it go? 
Um, and then if we capture, when do we do that work of deciphering, you know, that. who's here, why, and when, and what should be left alone and what should be preserved for other folks? All right, so there's a whole section in my, in my forthcoming book um, <laughs> uh, about capture, right? And the term capture and our use of capture, right? As black folks and as folks who have been captured, right? <laughs> and so, um, I think about my grounding principle in my research on black women and on black feminism is that I am here for black women. My research is here for black women. And so if I am to capture, if I am to hold something that someone has written, if I am to write about something that someone has done, then I am here for that work edifying, building, yes. putting, right, not yeah. challenging systems that oppress Black women, not causing further harm to them. Right. And it really is about an ethic of care in yes. that space, right? And you can't make folks do that. You have to be committed to that as an ethic if you're uh -huh. going to study Blackness and you're going to study Black folks. You need to love Black folks Yes, study Black folks. Because otherwise, what you're going to do is capture because you can and the power differential between myself as a researcher and the folks I'm studying is not something mm -hmm. I can overlook because we share a lineage, right. right? So just because you're a black scholar does not mean that you're not gonna enact your power onto the group of people that you're studying yeah. and use that and consume what they're doing and capture their words and capture their thoughts in ways that are detrimental to them. And so I have spent a lot of time thinking through that with the folks that I have been researching for 10 plus years, mm -hmm. because I feel like I'm in your intimate space now, mm -hmm. right? When you post on your Instagram stories, I'm watching you talk to your community of people and what you thought you were gonna share as a human, right? Not as your public persona. Mm -hmm. Those things get intermingled and mm -hmm. we have to spend a lot of time thinking about the impact and the implications of our work. So I hope that we continue to do that and have these conversations with folks who are starting out. I think we need it. I, in terms of method, um, and y'all might disagree, I rely on, for better or for worse, my social science background in journalism. And I run focus groups. That's what I just got this American University of Women grant to continue to run focus groups with Black Good. women to talk about care, like how they care for themselves online. So that's my way of, to Catherine's point, um, getting permission, sharing information, like, and we know that there are problems with interviews, right? Like we know that they have to be grounded in clear theory and grounded in clear research questions. You can't just ask questions and publish, right? That's not how it works. Um, but I, I find that talking to people, I'm interested in what's absent online a lot of times. So it's not just the post, but what are y'all um, scared to post about because of hypersexuality of black women? Or what um, are some ways that a post may not look like what we think it looks like, right? But you have to explain it for us, for other people to get it, if that makes sense. So. So my methodology sometimes is focus groups, just to see the community to, to, for me to step back and them to cultivate community this past semester. Some of the groups, several of the women were like, oh, we should do wine nights and they found friends with each other, you know? So like, I mean, that's beautiful to me to just to be in that space as you're saying that intimate space with them as they detail how they move online. And I know that's so different in your work, Dre. I mean, like, so I don't talk to the humans. I, Dre doesn't talk to the humans, right? Like, and so I don't interview, I've been trained to do interviews and I've done yeah, other yeah, research yeah. with it, but so often my work is about like being a part of a community and writing about that community and never saying, hey, I'm the researcher and like- And a lot of times that's harder. Yeah, uh -huh. that's harder. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 a, it's they're different strat. You know, always the question guides the method, right? And so there are times when you have to talk to people to know what their intentions were and what they were doing. But if if your question is not about that, right? If your question is what did you leave behind for us, mm. um, then then the the method that comes right. from that is right. these deep right. readings right. and the experience of being in those spaces when people are leaving those things totally. behind, right? Which is, is is a time suck, right? Like you're on your phone constantly. Like I'm watching your stories while it's happening. I'm on your feed while it's happening. And then I'm running to my space to take my notes like you would if you're in field work, right? So going back to social sciences, if I'm in your office doing 
field work, I can't in your face be like, who she right. said, right. right? I have to run to the bathroom afterwards and take my notes in the private space. Mm -hmm. And that's so much of what I think um, Dre does. And you can speak to your, your work better than I can, Dre, but what we do in our work. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I want Charlton to talk because I think Charlton's book is a good example yes. of mixed methods between mining Absolutely. Usenet and talking to Farai, right? Uh, but I do want to say, uh, in response to Raven's comments, I come out of uh, composition studies, rhetoric and composition studies. So I have a rhetorician's approach to text, right? So I'm looking at, the, like like Kat said so beautifully, the, the traces of what you left behind. Mm -hmm. And I'm also skeptical because of composition studies about retrospection. Uh, I don't necessarily believe that people are fully in touch with why they were writing what they were mm -hmm. writing in that moment. And they will re they will reminisce in ways that are true to themselves, but also that are performance for the interviewer themselves. And so I'd rather just go by the word. And what I need to do in the same vein as St. Clair Drake or Du Bois or other, you know, scholars of the Black condition, like Catherine said, I have to love them. I'm not looking for yeah. their pathology. I'm looking for right. their wholeness. Yes. And through that way, I can um, not necessarily gloss, uh, not necessarily extract, because I hate, uh, I'm really hating the word extraction at this moment. I see it as a condition of modernity, but be clear and as a translator, as a griot, to tell the stories that I feel are coming through in the text from a particular phenomenological mm -hmm. perspective, mm -hmm. right? To be able to understand the, the hermeneutic of responses, the wealth of responses around a particular hashtag or mm -hmm. event, right? In order to get that. And that requires a very different archival approach, yeah. right? And so uh, one last thing before I, I hand the mic back to Charleston, uh, I don't know if you remember the site the, um, the Black Folk in the Academy hashtag, right? And how they created such an uproar because they're like, please don't record the responses to this hashtag because we see it as private. And then this dude actually pulled together a lovely script that gathered all those responses and held them in the archive. He's like, here it is. If Black people want it, I'm willing to let them have it. I just did this as a convenience. And Black folk jumped on him. Like, how dare you? You don't love our people. There's no way you could do this properly. But they took the archive. <laughs> um, <laughs> but what it turns out in the end was the folk wanted to sell that archive so that they could make paper off of it. And they have fallen out because of that. Right. And so like, I'm, I'm like, I want to see the archive. I don't want to hear what your response, what your rationalizations were as to why you thought we should gather it or not. I want to see how people constructed themselves in that moment in response to that topic. And so yeah. Charlton, it's on you. Uh, yeah, I, I keep going back to, I think, one of the more poignant moments for me um, in doing some of my research, because I, I think one of the most exciting things for me was having access simultaneously to the archival record and to live human beings yeah, who were right. still blessed to be alive, that you could go back right. and talk about this idea of both the historical memory of what you've done 20, 25 years ago mm -hmm. and your reflection yeah. back on it. Mm -hmm. um, but what also came up to me is very clearly when I talk about, um, I often get this question, it's a good critique about the book, which is that you know it's a lot of male voices, historically black male voices. Um, and part of the story I don't get to tell in the book is the story of the silences of black women. Um, and so I think about Edith Vaughn, who was an early, I mean, 87, 88, uh, on BBS trying to do work to, to sell stuff. This is, you know, ordinary legal secretary in Brooklyn, uh, getting online, doing her thing. Um, so important to that moment. And for a year, Edette and I had an email exchange. Can I talk to you? What are you doing? Can I talk to you? Ah, not right now. No, I don't think so. Maybe tell me a little bit more. In this back and forth that to me said, there is a record of what I have done, but there is a way that there's a sense in which I want that record just to be mm. over and done. And I don't want to talk about it. And I got the sense that there was, you know, there was hurt, there was pain, there was all kinds of things that were happening in, in that sort of silence. Mm -hmm. And even to the, you know, look, I'd like to tell something of your story. And there's this archival record. Can I use it? And silence and no and then ultimately unfortunately you know she died somewhere uh, uh before being able to have the final word but i think that 
you know, encapsulates in a lot of ways the, the, uh, the problems here or the challenges of thinking about what to preserve, what not, where is a sort of overstepping when we think about archives and people who are living versus those who are leaving a legacy. I'd like to pose the question to Kat because you mentioned the intimate spaces of Instagram yeah. stories. And so what do you do then? What do you do with those spaces? So I write about some of the things that happen in those spaces. So long as I'm not on a close friends list um, or, a, you know, so this is really gets to the public private idea that Dre brought up, right? And how it's such a fallacy that there is this stark definition that these things are public and these things are private. We have been mixing these things together for a long time. The internet has made that very visible um, for a lot of folks. Right. And so this is right. also, I think about that idea of being very connected to how people use platform um, and how the people that I study use the platform, which is maybe different than how other people use platform. So I'll give you an example of a content creator that I study across Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and her own platform that she developed for followers, mm -hmm. and how different what she says is across those different platforms, what kinds of information she provides across them, even though technically all of those accounts are, are public, right? Technically, anyone could follow her on any of those places. But what she shares in those different places tells to me a story about her relationship with publicity and privacy, her relationship with cultivated community, and her deep knowledge of how platforms should be used and what they have the potential to do. But I wouldn't know that if I just captured her tweets. Like I wouldn't have any sense of that, of how the wedding story that she shared on Instagram stories was different than the link to the video of her wedding on right. Twitter, right? Right. Like right. there's a different conversation that she's having about the same event. And so we really have to think about where our concepts of privacy and publicity come from, how we've retooled them. I love and always go back to Zora Neale Hurston in the absence of the concept of privacy, right? And the characteristics of Negro expression, talking about how black folks have never had access to privacy in the traditional white Western sense in on this continent, right? <laughs> that we have always had to create this very interesting relationship between publicity and privacy because what was a private life when your body didn't fully belong to you? Like what was a private life when everything I, when my whole personage was on display and was accessible to people that I didn't give them access to it? it I still created then this relationship with the notion of privacy and publicity in that space, but it doesn't fit into the white Western mold. And so when we try to use that to define what black folks are doing online and say, well, this was public and this was private. And I know that because they turned on their private right. function right. on Twitter, trash, right? Like there's stuff I post on Twitter as a person who has followers that I know not everybody's gonna respond to or participate in. And I'm still a public person on Twitter. Right. And so I have to navigate that as a researcher by knowing the people I'm writing about, by knowing them well, by being in their space, by being a part of their complex community and their rhetorical community to know, to recognize when language shifts ever so slightly, you know, to Right. And so there are people who talk on Twitter in one way when I know my tweets are going to get retweeted and a way that I talk when I know that they're not. But how would you know that unless you followed me every day? You wouldn't know my voice in that space. Um, so I don't ascribe to the like, well, if you're public on Twitter, everything you say, you meant for everyone to see. I maybe knew that people could see it, but I maybe don't care that you saw it because you weren't my audience. I was talking to them. Is that privacy or is it something else? Mm -hmm. It's something else I'd say, right? I, I just don't think that that binary holds and I don't think that it, it's a, a useful binary. comes back to care though, right? Because if you're uh -huh. studying me because you want to talk about my deficits, if you're mm -hmm. studying me because you want to pathologize me, that's very different than if you're studying me because you love black folks and you love uh -huh. black women, because what then you'll choose to share and write about and how you write about it is going to be different. Mm -hmm. Man, but some of the scholarship I've seen in the name of love, Whoop. like I, I spent a whole chapter on black respectability about people who claim to love blackness, right? And yeah. the ways they love it are so carceral and coercive. Leasing. Yeah. Right. It's, it's, it's just, it's not even fun to read. Like uh, I put right. out, a, uh, just, I throw out random queries on Twitter and I was like, I really want to write about black Twitter or at least my timeline, their ironic use of Dr. Umar. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, but the levels of 
meaning that I'd have to unpack in order to, yes. to talk about how Umar is this hotep misogynist, but that Black Twitter is recapturing him to make that performance of self it's subverted and make it do something else. It's just like, there's just so much going on. Right. There's so much going on. I want to ask, I'm going to divert, uh, uh, divert again. I want to ask what tools you use to capture the archives mm -hmm. that you then study. So Biela Coleman had a really great uh, web uh, presentation. I think it was last week or the week before. And she brought up Devon Think which I used to use when I first started uh, using Max in the early 2000s, but which I abandoned because one thing it doesn't do is preserve links between sites, mm -hmm. right? Uh, what tools do you guys use now to capture the archives? Like, are there multiplicities of tools? Is it just like, I hope I see it on the timeline? Do you use mm -hmm. the fantastic doc now, right? To capture stuff, like what are you using? I love Catherine's point with your early research about like the Microsoft Word document and the, a lot of times we're cobbling things together. Basic. Like I've you right, basic. I've used in vivo. <laughs> I just read a paper by Rachel Cole where they're talking about um, Wakelet. So like pulling tweets um, and then, and then putting it on Wakelet and then analyzing from there. So like we know the tools, but honestly, I feel like a lot of what I do is a Microsoft Word document and just copying and pasting. I know, I know. And then highlighting. Again, we know the tools. We know the official things. Yeah. And we use the official things. But like, let's keep it real. But that's just me. I'll. This is the part where like, it's embarrassing that I directed a Black DH program for three years. Because I know the tools, right? And I have used in vivo. And I have used a lot of these tools before. Um, Airtable and et cetera, right? And what I, I default to is my training, which was which didn't have any of them yet, right? And so I continue to default to it. I'll learn the tool, I'll try it, right? Hand coding, right? Like pulling stuff, Facts. screenshotting, Facts. dragging links to Evernote or to Word, right? And creating Facts. subfolders for myself that makes sense without ever using like um, computing, like coding, I hand code, right? Because I need to, I really believe I need to be there. And that's probably something I can work out with my therapist, but I really feel like I have to be there and I have to read it while it's happening. And I have to see it while it's happening, or at least scroll back up a little bit for some context. Right. And so when the jokes, when the hashtags hit, you know, I have to have my phone with me and I have to be seeing that and experiencing it because also part of it is how I'm experiencing it as a part of that community member right, to understand right, right. a little bit more about how other folks are experiencing it. And there's a detachment in some of the, in some of the use of tools yes. that's hard for me. And that's because of my training, right? It's just, it's really about putting my hands on things mm -hmm. the best way I can in the way that I would if they weren't online, right? Like putting my hands and my eyes as close to the people and the words that I'm studying as possible. I'm curious to hear what Charlton said. I'm gonna just say real quick, I think that goes back to Dre's point about writing with love too. Like, I mean, so many of these tools we use and we love, but you're right. Like it, it feels detached from black communities and black culture. And when we're writing from a space of care or love, right? Like, I just wanna, I wanna be a part of it. I wanna be there in the moment as opposed to what, what was the word you used, right? Not capture, but like- Apprehend. Yeah, no, it wasn't apprehend. Something else. It was something, something else. you said you hate, but like, you know, oh, basically abstract. data. Abstract. Abstract. I, right. I don't like the abstractions. It like, yeah. It feels like you're abstracting the data, but Charlton, yeah. sorry. Yeah, no, right, right in line with that. I was gonna say, you know, I got a Mac, so it's con Control Shift Four. That's mm -hmm. that's most of mine. Control Shift Four, <laughs> a Word Doc, yeah. Google Doc, um, but mostly to this to this point of that sort of abstraction i mean so much of this is about the context and the context that you have to find and dig for so if you're looking at a usenet archive you're looking at trying to put together pay because you guys start fine where that conversation started because it's mm -hmm. all threaded through um and you can't do anything within you know google's uh capture of usenet now and saving so you gotta you know, the cut and paste, the everything. But I think it all comes back to, you know, Internet Archive is another one that I use, but that too, so insufficient because of all the broken links and so forth that you can't get uh, the real backstory and context to. So I think that's what's, what's lost and that's what's, uh, you know, just throws me back to that 
uh, you know, pre-tool days, as it were, as you spoke about. Um, I'd like to. Ask- I love Doc Now. I was going to say I love Doc Now. Mm-hmm. Shout out. Uh, I love them and I love what what um, was created in this, you know, like capturing a visual moment, right? Like the, the ability to like look for something and see a lot of things that are going on at once. And I find it to be a tool in the process of me then going through and doing what I do anyway, right? Is like, oh, Doc now allows me to like see this large, you know, to see the window, to see the large umbrella thing and then to like drill back down. Because I think part of understanding what's going on is me tracing how I get back to how the the joke started too, right? Like, so I saw the retweet or the retweet or the retweet and I want to cycle all the way back to see the layers and levels that it went through and the modifications that were made along the way. And I want to see who amplified and how that person's amplification mattered in it getting to me or getting to you or getting to these other folks. And it doesn't always, you're not gonna always get that depending on which tool you're using, right? This conversation is um, reminding, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. This conversation is reminding me about legitimacy of the archive. And I'm curious what y'all think about that. So a lot of us are admitting that like we do old school, you know, data gathering, but what do you think about so we do that, we screenshot and we do the Google Docs. Do you feel in your work that it has to be legible to certain big name audiences or whatever for, for it to matter, for black digital culture to matter? Have you read my book? You know, legible <laughs> to nobody but us. <laughs> Jason, I wrote this to us, so. <laughs> I mean, as a social science trained researcher, I'm very much aware of reliability and validity, right? And, but I'm also aware, and th- this is a point that you and Catherine have brought up really beautifully, that people are not going to bring the same perspective to the data that I preserve for them, right? They're not going to bring a, a necessarily a cohesive, a caring perspective to the data. Mm-hmm. And so, sure, you can preserve uh, the a blog post from Crunk and Disorderly, right? Uh, where uh, Fresh goes on and on about the wig crypt and she who shall not be named. And most (laughs) IT researchers will be like, well, look at the web links. Look at who she's linked to in the sidebar. Look at her advertising. And most Black folk will be like, well, you know, look at the ways in which Beyonce's name was constructed in this blog post and how the people responded to it. And none of them will, neither of them are really trained to look across both of those categories to see how the medium works with the discourse, right? And so- And then Dre gives us CTDA. Stop, stop, stop. (laughs) Uh, And so, no, it's a really good question, right? But I also- uh, we are gifted in that the internet allows an archival and a transcriptive category, I mean, capacity mm-hmm. to the, the documents that we save. Like, technically, they could be saved forever. But what the reality is, is that entropy always enters. And whether it's a planned entropy in the terms of the internet archive never really archived Black websites, right? <laughs> or if it's just uh, entropy where people get burnt and tired. Yeah. So, like, folk walking away from blogs because they, they just don't have it in them anymore to deal with that, right? We still have to account for that. And that to some people makes our work less than reliable as if we're different from any other digital researcher, yeah. but it's not, it's just part of the game. It's uh, also that- scary to me though, isn't it? The idea that like some of this has gone forever. And, and so while I talk all this stuff about, I'm not gonna preserve everything. I'm also simultaneously like really sad that so much of this <laughs> is gone. Because, you know, in in the book, I do this kind of piece where I'm writing about the lives of Ida B. Wells and Zora Neale Hurston. And I have all of these, all this, all these things they left behind, right? There are these archives that I get to visit and see their journal entries and their correspondence and all these things. And we therefore are able to write about the roots of Black feminist thought in really productive ways that crosses across the kind of writing that they left, right? Um, and then I look at the work of like the brilliant Jamila Lemieux or, you know, and I think I want, I want future people to know uh, what she did mm-hmm. and what she's yeah. left behind in that way. Yeah. She gets to decide that though, right? Like, and, but the issue is that for her center or for Wells, there's a different culture around keeping your correspondence and keeping and preserving your journals. That means that the people that leave behind you can have and preserve and have this beautiful archive, right? And we have many of us who came of age in digital writing. And this is what's really important. Who came of age writing for the first time online. Our thoughts, the first time they appeared were with the keyboard. We didn't write them down and then translate them. We have a different relationship with the tool where we think it's gonna always be there maybe, Mm -hmm. right? We think that we don't have to do the work of preserving our thoughts. 
Yeah. Okay. And so that is the space that actually is very worrisome to me as someone who wants to continue to study the brilliance that folks like this are, are dropping and have dropped for a decade mm -hmm. is that some of it is going away. And if we don't mm -hmm. do the writing right now, the historical yeah. and the historical writing now, right? If I'm not writing about the blogosphere mm -hmm. now before most of these links are dead, if we're not writing about these things and persisting in this, that some of this will be gone. And I think it's really incumbent upon yeah. us to not study just the newest thing but right. to study the things that are beginning to fade, to study the if things I'm, that we're about to lose a touch on. If I may, there's also an issue of control. So think of some of the early uh, Black bloggers who were using Blogger and TypePad. Yes. If they wanted yes. to withdraw their material, they could withdraw their posts, but they couldn't mm -hmm. get their comments, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Some of the early bloggers right. were able to preserve their sites because they built those sites by hand. And so they have, like, I'm talking to Fresh. Fresh has all of her stuff, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm talking to Lynn. Lynn was one of the early, uh, Lynn Lova is her name on Twitter, but she was one of the earliest Black bloggers, Black women bloggers out there, right? She has all her stuff mm -hmm. because she continually was redesigning the site. But there are so many That's more right. people who just threw stuff up, built a community, like Ta-Nehisi Coates. He doesn't have his type pad site it's anymore. That's stuff. how he right, got right, to right. the Atlantic. Right. right? Mm -hmm. The thing I was thinking too, though, when you brought up Hurston, Hurston got hit got was had a hit job put on her by right right and so most folk didn't even know where her grave was until alice walker went and found and, and oh, paid correct. Pro appropriate homage that's so correct. this is not a new phenomenon for black archivists in many cases our people have been buried in the cemetery of the forgotten right because they fell out of style or they fell out of fashion mm -hmm. and so we're still continuing this tradition right of of trying to unearth the, these, I hate to say unearth these bodies, it sounds so terrible, right? But of remembering yeah, those who, yes. have, who have transitioned past this particular digital moment in their lives mm -hmm. and trying to, to recapture right. some of those spaces. So. I think a big challenge is this, the moment, the burst where people think, I'm thinking of the Judas and the Black Messiah movie that just came out, right? So, at, right, as we're thinking, right, about Hampton and, and all of a sudden now he's cool <laughs> or now the Black yeah. Panthers are cool, right? And mm -hmm. without folks understanding, like we're talking about the history of the Black Panthers or the history of women in the Black, Black women in the Black Panthers, right? Um, yeah, it's absolutely our job to, to write about this so that it's not just a burst in time. That's another question out there, which is about institutions and so thinking about where Makiba began this discussion and you know Catherine you you have a, a humanities archive um, and, and center um, I mean what is required to do what we have to do in terms of preservation and archiving particularly of black um, digital life do we need other black institutions to be able to do that? Do we need yes. a groundswell? But what, what beyond <laughs> us as individual yes. researchers right. to carry right. that mantle and responsibility? I have a piece of an answer to that. Uh, I manifested a conversation with folk at Twitter, shout out to Jazz Walker, right? And they were like, well, you know, we have this academic program that we want academics to reach out and get a, sub, a set of, twi of tweets that they can study. And they're like, but you can only have 10 million. And me, <laughs> the rhetorician is like, we'll do a 10 million tweets. That's just too many. It's too many, right? But if you think about it, Twitter is doing a billion tweets a day. <laughs> what 10 million going to do? Like, it's just, it's just not enough. And so, you know, it's a very real question of not only what our tools preserve, but what our tools can handle and what are the limits mm -hmm. of an archive when the archive itself is the Borgian library, right? The map of the world. What, what, what then do you begin to focus on? And this is the thing I try to impress upon my grad students. Like, everything is out there. What is important to me is that you show me as an analyst that you have a structured systematic <clears throat> inquiry into a phenomenon that identifies not only the archive, but the scope to which you can ask these questions. And to, that becomes our ethics of care, right? We, we get to choose what topics we deem important. We get to choose what data necessarily yeah. is a way to answer this particular question. And then to, to, to go back to Charlton's point, like at that point, then we say, this is the stuff that needs preserving, but also we captured all this other data in the process of capturing this. And that needs preserving as well for future researchers' generations. I see the lovely Makiba Foster on my screen. This has been such a wonderful conversation. Thank you all for 
uh, shedding light on us being not, you know, new to stuff, but true to it. So I really appreciate, and this is exactly what we imagine in terms of having this conversation. Um, as practicing librarians and archivists, um, it's important that we understand the scholarship that has gone forth in really being able to, to imagine the future of how we think about um, building of collections based on digital content. And so we have a couple of questions um, from our chat and the chat has been on fire. And then I'm just amazed at how you all can multitask it, pay attention and answer questions. <laughs> in the chat anyhow. You know, that's the, the world that we live in, but you all are technologists, so you got it in the bag. So this is, a question. <laughs> <laughs> is a question from um, Donna Combs Montrose to Raven. How are dias diasporic archivists contributing to the developing narratives and collections? Mm -hmm. The historical bodies have always been at the table of performances, the Malcolm X, Granada, and the Stokely Trinidad. How can we contribute? Okay, I can't say that I'm a diasporic um, scholar. So I write about black culture in the United States. I've been here 20 plus years. So I'll say that. Um, I do have a piece, somebody reached out to me. She's from Guyana and it was a while ago. So we wrote about like being Caribbean online. Um, so I'm happy to put that in the chat if you want. Let me look back at the question, hold on. It's in the Q and A part. I'm attending the oh diaspora archivist contributing to the developing there. So uh, I, I'll put in the chat some readings that I'm doing. What's going on in the Caribbean is the same digital divide conversation we're talking about. We were talking about in our conversation, meaning um, people in the Caribbean aren't. This is the narrative. People in the Caribbean aren't online. There's no internet. You know, them don't know how to use the internet. What am I going to do? You know, all these things. Whereas um, right, the internet is very robust in places like Jamaica and the Caribbean, um, due to the Atlantic slave trade, right, has a lot of connections between islands as well as to the US and another continent. So um, there's a lot of connections and it's very understudied. Um, I, I, I think more work needs to be done. And so I guess the context of her question when she she wrote something else, she said, because her above comment was trying to continue the oral histories and community building through mm. um, archival lens. Um, and so yeah. she said from Canada, but trained in at, at Wayne State. There um, is a wonderful panelist. Help me if you know her. She's at Yale. She's a Caribbean technologist. I'll I'll find her name and put her in the chat. But she actually has a website where she archives um like diasporic blackness and technology so i'll find her name and i actually follow her on twitter to answer your question okay I, i'm sure this doesn't help but one of my canonical books the one i reach back to often uh -huh. is uh miller and slater's uh the internet and ethnographic approach where they yeah. spent 11 years in trinidad and yeah. i use it even though they're white men who did ethnography in the caribbean which sounds like the worst ethnographic expedition in the yeah. world like having to go to carnival every year. I can imagine how terrible. Um, but one of the things they said was that the Trinidadians made the internet Trinidadian. Yeah, yeah. Right? In part because there's, they are one of the most uh, global populations. There are Trinidadians yes. in Toronto, in yes. New York, all around the world. And so they had already thought of themselves as a population with global roots and they have built webs of disbursements and uh, you know uh, sending money back home but also bringing carnival to other spaces and mm. so I think of uh, the Caribbean in that way that web that is because uh, not because but in spite of the fact that it was brought to serve as a labor potential has also ended up enlivening the western hemisphere with uh, this mixture of African Indian Chinese mm. and indigenous uh, identity and so mm -hmm. um, capturing that is I would argue in more ways difficult than doing it from an American context, because where do you start with that web of influences, yeah. right? But at the same time, it provides an inc incredibly rich environment to talk about what all is brought to shape a Caribbean identity that is largely informed by, you know, the, the middle passage, right? right? Uh, and I was thinking it's just about, a fascinating conversation. Sorry, Dre, I was thinking about tropic no. tendencies. I'm the annoying mm -hmm. person that's going to pull up a book, but um, that's a good one about the Caribbean. Actually, it's about um, Trinidad and how people online move mm -hmm. in Trinidad. 
Okay, so we have a, qu a question um, from Courtney Muma, who says, when I teach and consult with digital archivists about accumulating archives, I recommend they consult with people from the communities embedded in or with deep knowledge of those records. Mm -hmm. What other recommendations can I make? Also, thank you for the new perspective on capture, a lot to think about. Man, enough of us have MLIS degrees or came out of high schools to know that library and information science is a missionary discipline, right? And they don't necessarily understand what it means when they say they're going to go into communities. Like they bring their tools, they bring their theoretical perspectives and then try to warp those communities into, into performing in those ways, right? Uh, and so it's a really fraught enterprise. I would argue it's on the same level as any other ethnographic or participatory action research approach. You have to become part of that community in order to um, be able to be able to be able to build out an archive that they would find useful. Mm -hmm. Not your grant, not your department, not your institution, but something that is built to their needs and desires. And so if they want to build a grant about what particular materials go into mosque costumes, that's on them. Right, you don't need to make it so that it then becomes an empowering moment where those people who are costumers can make money from later on. Like that's not, it's not your role, fam. Unless that's something that they want, and so it's a constant problem. I see. I mean, coming out of LIS, although I haven't been in an LIS department in a few years, it's it's something that's always troubled me, particularly with the rise of what was called community informatics, right? Which I know more than a few of you are still associated with, right? It's how to push back the institutional and and disciplinary imperatives to once again capture, right? To extract that particular knowledge as if it is a um, a generalizable knowledge available for access to the world as opposed to the property of these people and the way they live their lives and understand themselves. So one of the things that, that I'm thinking about in terms of your research, when you all are talking about data and creating archives and in some of this is you're building your own resources, you know, which you can consult. I'm wondering, what are you thinking about in terms of future of the, the kind of more formal archives? Is that going to be a space that you envision um, for um, scholars after you to be able to still understand technology or, or what, what are your thoughts on the, the future of the archive as scholars? I've been thinking about this a lot in finishing this, this text because I and I'm very grateful to the archivists and librarians who helped me better understand this over the last several years working with, with uh, digital humanities is um, trying to understand my role as a researcher who's documenting what's going on right now and the relationship between the people who are present in the quote data, right? Like the people, the actual whole human beings who are there and as Dre said, what they need from the work that I'm doing and what others will need from those folks over time. So without those folks, I would not have done a lot of the historical work I did for this book and so I'm really grateful for it. But what it reminded me of was how important the archives that existed were <laughs> for me to study these folks who had been writing a hundred plus years ago and how non-existent they will be in a hundred years for the folks that I'm writing about right now and what that will mean. And so I've been sitting with that and thinking about that in terms of whether folks who are writing right now want their work captured, why or why not? And what is the distrust of having that work captured that they're experiencing? And it's valid, right? It's very valid, but I am worried as someone who studies black feminist thought of missing this whole period of robust intellectual thought that's happening solely online and is not going to exist for us to look back at in the way that we're looking back at what happened in the 1950s or the 1850s mm -hmm. or, you know. So I, I don't have an answer to it other than that's why I said this is a fear that I really hold is that and why I'm, I'm feverishly trying to write about what people are doing right now in respectful ways and ways that are with them and not about them. Um, but I'm uncertain how much people want their work kept and whether we've really thought about what that means uh, for future scholars. I'm just curious, Makiba. So there's an article that came out in 2005 in um, UCLA's uh, library journal, this guy named Todd Hanma, H-O-N-M-A, and Race and Racism in Library Information Science. And for those of you who are pursuing an MLIS right now, if you haven't seen it, I'll see, I'll see if I can drop the link in the, the chat, but it's really 
influential and in that he articulated a lot of these concerns that I mentioned about what it means to be black and brown in library and information science. And when I said a missionary, I meant that literally as a you know, Methodist missionaries going to Africa. Like I've been in community informatics spaces where they're like, oh, well, um, let's uh, bring these little black kids texts on uh, what it's like to be a gang member. And the kids would push back and say, I want to read about Shakespeare. I, I know what it's like to be a gang member, right? And so, you know, I, I think it's important to understand. And I, I get pushback from archivists sometimes, maybe because I'm out of touch, but I also think archivists, in many cases, you know, liberal white folks uh, are not necessarily aware of what their liberalism brings to the communities that they want to study and understand. And that's something that we constantly uh, should be pushing back on. Thank you. I want to say that 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 element of, of care, I think, is um, crucial to me that uh, everyone's talked so much about. And, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people who's sitting on uh, two hard drives of an archive, uh, thinking and wondering what to do with it, if anything, and where to connect it to and whether it's going to be available. And um, the closest thing I can think of is remembering going back to uh, a fair amount of, of times at the, the Howard um, library and just encountering folks who I could tell in conversation with had a deep respect for and care for what was in that particular archive and the things that I was looking at. So I think that's, you know, my somewhat answer has to be a connection to somewhere where I feel comfortable, where people care about um, what's there. I don't know that I can make the decision about those questions of uh, whether we should sort of preserve or, or what, but I think handing off to institutions that, uh, that uh, have that ethic of care fundamentally in, in what it is they do. I think one of the uh, questions, and I'd love for Catherine to jump in on this as well, having done time with Mellon, is who are the funders, right? Because maintaining digital archives is a costly proposition. Right, not only in terms of the electricity necessary and the staffing necessary, and the, uh, for both the con make sure sure the content doesn't rot, but also that the machines work. But those machineries go out of date. I've got zip drives with dissertation data in them. What damn, I can't hook a zip drive up to nothing these days. I need to figure <laughs> out a transfer. I've got scusi ports, you know that that have that have drives connected to them. What I'm what I'm going to do with that, right? And so. When you talk about being an archivist, it's really interesting to me, for me to hear where you're coming from as an archivist, who is your organization, and are they committed to the long term for these digital resources, which are too big to be printed out, like nobody wants to put rings of paper in a space, the attraction of the digital is the fact that it is searchable and retrievable, right? But then what are you willing to commit to maintain this archive past the terms of your grant? Right. <laughs> past I the mean, terms and that's the key, right? It's past right. the terms of the grant because there are so many, just like someone who's, uh, you all probably have as well, like reviewed for NEH digital grants, right? And like so many people want to start these, you know, community projects where they're building an archive with other folks. And it's like, and it's this three year project and we're going to do this thing. And you will get rejected because, thankfully, at least in that case, NEH knows like, you have to have a plan for this beyond when this, this money's going to run out. Mm -hmm. Like this is not a sustainable idea if you're going to have it only as long as you're being funded externally. And so part of what we have insisted upon at, at Maryland with Mellon, and, and we're very fortunate to the Mellon Foundation for their funding for both um, for both the uh, Adhum project, which I was a part of for three years, and now for Disco, which both Dre and I are a part of, um, is that if your institution buys in, right? And that's the key, right? Is that with these large grant projects, getting the institutional buy-in to keep the funding for this going, to keep the resources and to keep people attached to it, because that's also the hard part, right? It's the infrastructure and the tech that needs to be updated constantly, but also are you willing to have folks that are going to work on this institution beyond the length of time that the grant is paying their salary? Like, how is that going to work? So it's so important, this idea of sustainability. We don't have it figured out, I think, as a collective yet, but hopefully we're moving in at least re reminding ourselves that it's so important to figure this out. So we have another question from the chat um, from Perry Busby. As we begin to grow more digitally, 
is there concern that more that the more our data grows, so does our dependency on it being held by entities outside of our control? The question is, is there a concern about that? Yes. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean. I see Dre's face, go ahead. <laughs> I get this question a lot, right? Because, and I wrote about this in Blackbird, we are super concerned about what, and Catherine stated this beautifully early as well, what happens with our data once it leaves our mouths? right? Who owns it? Who gets to license it? Who gets to use it? And where will it be stored, right? And that cat is out of the bag, right? That, that we cannot preserve the infrastructure necessary. We cannot even afford the infrastructure necessary to preserve these utterances on the scale in which many people are thinking. And so in many ways, the, the best decisions come down to community level moderation and preservation, right? but also uh, best practices and principles, a philosophical approach to what you can and will be online, right? Because that's the real way, that's the way that things end up being eternal, right? When you build the institution, the ways to confront this information and share it with the world, as opposed to simply a mechanistic way of saying, I got these hard drives, what, what's up, right? Uh, and so that's a difficult thing to get people to, to, to do. I worked with the East St. Louis Action Research Project Right. And one of the questions I they, they would work with churches because they saw churches as these memory institutions that had a longstanding presence in the community. But when I walk into the church and I say, well, what's your philosophy of technology? They're like, well, what to who? Right. <laughs> like, but what is how is this technology expressing you now in the future? And then when people look back on it as your past. And that's something many communities have not really had fully time to think about it other than I don't want to be exploited. Right. And so this is a question I think that should be asked at every meeting where community archives are talking about being pulled together, right? Getting to think about the past, present, and future of this preservation. Uh, but also when you're thinking about your online presence, right? So Catherine mentioned and Raven mentioned both the ways you can go private to preserve conversations, the way you can go to group chats or other back channels to preserve conversations. Understand that there's always gonna be multimodal ways of presenting the self in digital spaces, and you will never have full access to all those things, and that's intentional, mm -hmm. right? And by understanding that, then you don't necessarily get as worked up over the fact that this one channel, this one Twitter feed is held by Twitter and they can license it, whatever, because you know, you put the important parts, the parts that you deem private or necessary for yourself in another channel to which hopefully you have downloaded your iMessage archive. Right. Or <laughs> or other spaces. Right. But yeah, that the the modernity has taken that capacity, I think, in many ways out of our hands. Uh, and that's a really crap answer to, to offer. Uh, but that's really the best way I can put it. Maybe y'all have a different perspective. on it. I'll only add I'm so glad you mentioned the public private piece that that Catherine was talking about, because to, I mean, to the title of the panel, um, not new to this, Black folks have have been, we've been known ways to sidestep surveillance, right? Whether it be through language, whether it be through humor, whatever. So like surveillance is gonna be there, especially the more, um, the more technology control that expands. But like we find ways to sidestep, right? Algorithms, we find ways to create our own algorithmic spaces. Um, and I, I, I know that's what many of us are interested in, like the people and the users. I mean, there's some folk out there worried that they're going to get 5G through the vaccine while they're tweeting from their phone with their GPS radio, Bluetooth, and Wi-Fi already activated. Like, 5G has found you, my G. Like, you ain't got to worry about no need. Oh, it's also the mark of the beast. Apparently, it's the mark of the vaccine is something with the devil. Well, on that note... <laughs> This has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you all for your, your thought and insight. Um, one of the questions we had was about, you know, is this for knowledge, for knowledge sake? But one of the things for us is to understand where we've been, truly understand where we've been. Um, and so we can actually work towards creating um, web archiving practices that are, that take in an account and ethic for care and all those things. So we are very, fortunate that you all started us off with a bang. This was really wonderful. I've got to go back and read the chat because people were dropping knowledge all through. Uh, I want to thank uh, you 
Um, Makiba, will y'all uh, preserve? Will y'all preserve the chat, Makiba? Because a lot of people yeah. are asking if they could have access yeah. to it. Okay. We are and so and and folks want to know your all your um, research and and bibliography. So we're gonna compile all that stuff um, to be able to share because this is this is historic in nature, and I'm just so thankful um, for all this this this. Quick wonderful thank you to you, Makiba. And to yes, Bert. thanks Bert. to the organizers. Bert. It was fantastic. Yeah. All right, thank y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see y'all. Next panel is, is going to be dope too. It's, it's going to be for the culture, Black memory and storytelling on the web. So um, join us for that as well.